Aloha and welcome to the Isaacs Art Center at Hawaii Preparatory Academy. My name is Justin Sanduli, class of 2012, and today we're going to be exploring the Madge Tenant Art Collection here at Isaacs Art Center. This collection was entrusted by the trustees of the Tenant Art Foundation in 2005 to HPA and it came over here in a period of about three years during which the assets were transferred, and the paintings were conserved, and we're so very fortunate to have this collection here by Hawaii's arguably greatest contributor to the cultural legacy of these islands. Discovering Madge Tenant was for me a wonderful accident. I knew nothing about Hawaiian art at all. I went to university to study art history, but I was interested in Italian Baroque. That's where my interest mostly stayed until Molly became the director here in 2014. And I came to visit her one day, and I think she was in a meeting with a client. So I finally took the time to explore and see what this place was actually doing. And that is when I found myself in the Madge Tenant Gallery. Not knowing anything about Madge Tenant or Hawaiian art at all and how she fit into this sort of whole narrative, but I realized that these paintings were doing something in this beautiful, highly theatricalized, dramatic, you know, lots of vitality, motion, and grace way that actually wasn't too far of a leap for my interest in the Italian Baroque. But what was different is that I hadn't seen any scholarship on her at all as I began to sort of dig into this. Uh, and I thought, well, that's sort of an injustice. There's been lots of stuff done about these great Italian Baroque painters and sculptors that I'd love so much, but nothing about her. And I thought, well, this is just as compelling. It's just as moving, and I, I react to it just as strongly. When I started talking to Molly and she told me more about the artist and I started to learn more about Hawaiian art in general and I really became so interested, I decided to write my um, senior distinction thesis on her. So that was the beginning of my uh, fanatical journey with Madge Tennant. When Madge Tennant died in 1972, she was already considered the most significant individual contributor to Hawaiian art in the 20th century and that's a legacy that continues on to this day. Now with hindsight, it's not hard to see why. What is interesting is how unlikely she was ever to have won that distinction in the first place. Born in England, trained in Paris, lived and worked in Hawaii for 50 years, and never once painted a beach or a shack or a palm tree. Before her, most artists were focused on the natural beauty of Hawaii, the landscapes, the flowers, the seascapes, the volcanoes. And whenever you did see a human figure, it was there to populate the scene. But the scene itself remains the major focus. And so Madge Tennant shows up in 1923, sort of a whippersnapper, and she says, you know what, that's fine. She's not interested in landscape painting anyway, but I think the real beauty of Hawaii is to be found in its people particularly the women, and that's what I'm going to focus on, and indeed that's what she spends the rest of her time here, which is just shy of about 50 years, focusing on. One remarkable thing is how much support she had from her family from even a very young age. It was clear that she was a gifted prodigy from, from the get-go. When she was a young girl in Cape Town, they put her through the art school there, and finally the dean came to her parents when she was about 11 or 12 years old and said, look, we've taught her everything we can. She's exhausted the curriculum. If you're serious about her having a, a successful career, which clearly she has the talent to do, you need to get her into a proper art school in Paris. And her parents not only send her to, to Paris, they actually uproot their lives to go and move themselves there as well. So for four years, the whole tenant, uh, the whole Cook family, sorry, uh, her, her family's name was Cook, they picked themselves up out of South Africa, moved to Paris um, in order to enable her to do those studies. At one point in her training in Paris, she got so frustrated that she was only looking at women that looked like her, you know, white European women who, you know, fine, that's the only ones they brought into the studio, but she thought that wasn't enough. So she would actually go out onto the streets, and this is a 15-year-old girl, and look for anyone who looked different at all, and then whatever astonished person she ran into, she'd haul them into the studio on her one day off and ask to paint or draw them, which I think is pretty extraordinary. So when she gets to British Samoa, that kind of percolating fascination with these difference in, in ethnicities and how they you know, manifest themselves in, in facial expressions explodes. It's like a firecracker going off. And so she spends the next six years there painting and drawing everyone in sight. She does at least one portrait every single day. And this later becomes very important when she gets to Honolulu. They're taking the two boys back to England to enroll them in school. 
they're staying there for two nights. They meet up with some acquaintances, mutual friends. And just for fun, she pulls out some of the portraits that she'd done. And they looked at her quite seriously and they said, you know, because of burgeoning tourism industry and multiculturalism, the Hawaiians are going to disappear. Time is running out and you alone have the talent to capture them before they vanish. Will you stay and do that? Probably thinking that she would say if she was going to stay maybe a year, maybe a little bit longer. And she says, yeah, I'm do it. let's do it. You know, I'm total game. And she ends up not only doing it, she spends the rest of her career doing it, the rest of her life doing it. The whole family is there supporting her while she's doing it. And then, you know, here we are today with this wonderful legacy around us, these wonderful paintings that came from that, that trajectory and that career. The paintings in this room came at what might be called the height of her career, and I don't mean that strictly in terms of formal characteristics, although obviously they are spectacular, but this was the point at which she was starting to become a household name, not just in Hawaii, but also on the mainland and internationally. She had, by 1940, she had many one-woman shows, uh, California, New York, Chicago, San Francisco. London, Paris, Cairo, Cape Town, have really been all over the place, which if you think about the size of these works and the enormous cost of transporting them back then, because they were, were before the jet age here, so getting them to Europe was just a feat in itself. Originally though, in the first couple of years she was doing this, she was going from these portrait commissions, which are very lovely but formalist and academic, into this more abstracted vein. And people were saying, well, why are you doing that? Because you do these portraits so well, you paint so well, you draw so well, why are you throwing your talent away? And uh, I think she did run into some controversy as well in terms of the choice of subject matter and how she was representing the Hawaiians. Because there were people who said, why is it that you're making fun of them? You're painting them as these big fat ladies, you know, and, and you're, you're, these are caricatures and it's ridiculous. What are, you, what are you thinking? You know, you're just here, you're coming from Europe and you're just here to make fun of us. And, and that of course wasn't her aim at all. She was trying to translate onto the campus the warmth and the grace and the love and the motion and the feeling. It was this very celebratory focus on Hawaiian beauty at the turn of the century, which was a very different aesthetic. It was this, this appreciation of amplitude back then. And that's not what was happening in the 20s and 30s if you think about other contemporaneous images of these lovely slender hula girls on the beach with the ukulele and the coconut bra. Like that's not at all what the values were turn of the century and 19th century. And that was what she was trying to say is I think the beauty of Hawaii is best expressed in its people, but from a different vantage point, from perhaps a more localized vantage point. So how wonderful it is that Madge Tennant did come here and found the Hawaiian people and chose to devote her life to expressing them and elevating them and giving them voice on an international scale. We're so, so grateful to that, to her for doing that. And I, I have to say it's, it's such, such a great good fortune for us to be able to present these works here and be able to share them with the world and, and celebrate her position within the, the canon of the great American modernists of the 20th century. And I have to say, speaking of good fortune, here's Molly Husis, our director. I couldn't help but listen to your wonderful, inspiring oh. art talk. Oh, I thank you. I never tire of listening to you discuss Madge Tennant. Well, I never tire of talking about her, so thank you. <laughs> thank you for always being there to listen. You're so very welcome. It's my honor and privilege, Justin, and nurturing and creating opportunities for students to experience art and to learn more about it is something that I really care about very deeply. HPA had actually planned, intended to build an art gallery that would support the scholarship program, education, and also provide a cultural nexus for our community. And it happened that in 1999, this wonderful building that was a 1915 Waimea schoolhouse was condemned and about mm. to be torn down. And mm. HPA intervened, saved it, and actually moved six classrooms across town, two wow. classrooms at a time. And with the help of, and the support of George and Shirley Isaacs, mm -hmm. and all the donors, who sponsored each of the classrooms in the building. It was actually made an ideal museum setting for mm -hmm. this marvelous collection of Madge Tennant that had been gifted to HPA. It really fits our sustainability mission as well, mm -hmm. that we have conserved, restored, uh, an historic building 
as well as the great art within. And it is also important that every sale and purchase in Isaac's Art Center actually helps to benefit the financial aid at HPA. Together, we can make magic. Mahalo, Mahalo and, and we'll, we'll see you at, at Isaac's, Isaac's Art Center. Art Center.